Well, hi there. This creature is a sulfugid, also known as a camel spider or sun spider. Though if you've seen our deep dive into all of the arachnids, you're probably already aware that they're not actually spiders or camels or suns, at least with a U. It's likely that somewhere in the order of half of them are suns with an O, but that isn't the kind of sun spiders that they are. And being nocturnal, calling them sun spiders doesn't make much sense on a couple of levels. They are also called wind scorpions, which makes some sense given that they can run like the wind, but they aren't scorpions either. And they don't have claw pedipalps or a stinger, so I'll probably refer to them mostly as sulfugids if that's okay with you. I love these little guys. Like true spiders and scorpions, sulfugids are arachnids, which means that they're part of the larger group Chalicerata. Chalicerae are claw-like mouthparts possessed by arachnids and other chalicerates. I first noticed them on scorpions, but for their size, sulfugids have probably the biggest and most terrifying chalicerae of all. They're horrifying. And since they have no venom or other means of dispatching prey, they tend to kill their prey by simply tearing it to pieces with these horrifying scissors of death. If there is a more terrifying face in the animal kingdom anywhere, I really want to know what it is. But the terrifying doesn't end at the face. Their entire body plan is wonderfully unnerving. Like other arachnids, they have two main body segments, or tagmata, with the prosoma up front and the opisthosoma to the rear. Now, I really doubt that you're going to confuse a sulfugid with a scorpion, as they lack both of the most recognizable features of scorpions. But their basic shape is fairly spider-like. That said, they can be easily distinguished from spiders because, unlike spiders, their chalicerae are not modified into hypodermic fangs. Additionally, unlike spiders, their opisthosoma are divided into 10 segments. There are also many other differences discussed in our arachnid video, but those two differences should be plenty to help you identify that you have a sun-avoiding non-spider, a sulfugid, and not a true spider. Like spiders and other arachnids, they have eight walking legs and two feeding assistance pedipalps. In the case of sulfugids, the legs are usually the biggest at the back and they get smaller towards the front. That is, until you get to the pedipalps, which are huge and leg-like, differentiating them from scorpions, in which they are claw-like. These are awesome, scary-looking, rather fast little creatures. But are they good pets? And is the sulfugid the best pet arachnid for you? To help you figure this out, we'll have to give the not scorpion that runs like the wind a score based on our five categories, which are handleability, care, hardiness, availability, and upfront costs. When it comes to handleability, we give the sulfugid a one out of five. They get that point because other than a little scissor snip that is a possibility, they don't pose any real threat to humans. They're also small and can be moved from one enclosure to another with relative ease. That said, it is probably best to avoid touching your sulfugid. They are fast, which is not ideal when trying to handle one. They are pretty soft-bodied and prone to rupture. And depending on the size of your sulfugid, they could bite you. At best, you can say that you handled your sulfugid for a few seconds. At worst, and this isn't very unlikely at all, you can say that you tried to handle your sulfugid and it got away or was killed as a result. But that doesn't mean that you can't interact with them. In the past, when I have kept these, I have found that they eagerly feed off of tongs or even right out of your fingers. So that's really fun. However, if what you want is a terrifying looking harmless arachnid that you can handle, you should check out our video on vinegaroons. If you're enjoying this content about sulfugids, I just want to let you know that we have a ton of amazing content about arthropods of all kinds. And in fact, we recently went all the way to the Peruvian Amazon to find the biggest and craziest and most terrifying arthropods that we possibly could. And a lot of people, when they watched that video, they were like, I thought this was gonna be clickbait. It wasn't though, because it wasn't. There are some amazing things, and I can tell you that that trip was only possible due to the support of our patrons at Patreon. So if you would like to see us be able to create more content like this in the future. Maybe go to other parts of the world and see what kinds of crazy arthropods they have. 
please consider supporting us on Patreon. There's also a lot of really cool features I'm sure you'll enjoy seeing. When it comes to care, we give the Soul Fugit a score of four out of five. This was a really difficult score for me to calculate. These guys are notoriously difficult to keep alive, though I do suspect that some of the dead soul fugids that people have had were not as dead as they appeared. Soul fugids tend to come from more deserty regions. As such, they should be kept on sandy substrate. But they usually do well at room temperature because they are not active during the heat of the day. They tend to spend the day down in a burrow. Thus, make sure that your substrate is deep enough for them to burrow and that it will hold a burrow and not collapse. This can partially be achieved by regularly adding water. Be sure that you do not flood their burrow, but a moisture gradient is needed, with the substrate getting wetter the deeper you get into it. It should be pretty dry on the surface, though. They can climb, so make sure that they can't get high enough to allow a dangerous fall and that you have a very secure lid, but proper ventilation. You don't want it to be humid in the enclosure. They eat insects that are small enough to subdue and shred with their Edward Scissorface Calicerae. And I have noticed, since we put this one in here, that they do seem to like to drink water droplets off of the side. So we've got a little bit of water available. She's definitely taking advantage of that. But I would say adding a little bit of water in, in droplets on the side from time to time would be much appreciated. And those are the basics of care. Now for their false deaths. First, these animals tend to be active only for a little while and then go dormant for months at a time. If you don't see your freaky looking friend for a while, don't give up hope. But that isn't the scariest thing that they do. Because you might come in one day and find your soul fugid on its back with all of its legs sticking up in various positions. You know, that position that your dog assumes when you ask it to play dead? Tarantulas do this also, to scare the pants off every new spider keeper. And then the next morning, you walk in and find your dead spider not nearly as dead as you remember it. Just a bit bigger than the last time you saw it. And standing next to what looks like another tarantula that was sucked out of its exoskeleton. Ectysis. They're molting. Not dead. Joke's on you. But imagine that a month or more later, it's still just lying there, motionless, on its back with its legs all disordered and erect. What then? This, this has to be death, right? Well, not if it's a soul fugid. Apparently, they can hang out like that for months before they molt. I would assume this is just to mess with humans for giving them so many inaccurate names. But I would imagine that a lot of pet soul fugids that weren't dead yet have seen an early grave as a result. Bring out your dead! Here's one! No, I'm I'm not dead! Just don't be surprised if one day you walk in and your dead soul fugit is feeling happy and going for a walk. So I really can't tell you when to give up on your dead soul fugit. I recognize that this advice will probably lead to a lot of people keeping enclosures with dead soul fugits in them. But I guess that beats a lot of tiny graves with live soul fugits inside. So let's discuss hardiness, shall we? This is all so complicated because I don't know what percentage of all dead soul fugits were actually dead but they are notoriously difficult to keep alive in captivity. I just can't tell you why this is the case. They seem to do very well in my experience, though this can differ based on the exact species that you keep. This is one of the Arizona sulfugids, the only species I have kept, and they seem to do better than most. They seem to eat well and behave normally, but then they just die. So I'm gonna give them a two, but I'm gonna call it an optimistic two, that maybe they're often not dead yet, and they will get better with a little patience. All the same, they can be very fragile, so injury can also cause death, and that will not be mistaken identity. So too. But I would love to change that in the future if it turns out that they're only mostly dead, because there's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. When it comes to availability, we give the fake dead, fake spider, scissor-faced micro sand demon a score of three out of five. They are available online, but I'm pretty sure that they're all field collected. I don't know anybody breeding them, but I'd love to hear about it if you're having regular success doing so. If you can, your best option is probably to field collect your own. At least it will be fresh from the wild and more likely to be alive and well when it gets to you. Until recently, I had never seen them at expos or in pet shops, but... I now know that it can happen because Prime Pets in Spanish Fork, Utah has them available 
right now. So if you want a soul fugit from someone you can trust, check out Prime Pets. But again, and I rarely recommend this, but if you really want one and they exist in your area, catching one yourself is probably your best bet. When it comes to upfront costs, we give the Soul Fugit a score of five out of five. The Soul Fugit itself may be free, though they are a bit expensive if you buy one online. Everything else will not be very expensive at all. Mostly you need an enclosure with a very good lid and some sand, it's reasonable. And that is why overall, we give the Soul Fugit a score of 3.0 out of five. That is frankly much higher than I anticipated, but it does reflect a little optimism that these guys are sometimes being given up on for all dead when they're actually only mostly dead. I just don't know what the actual numbers are. Once you bury them, they are all, all dead. So hopefully a few can be saved by this video and we can get some better information about it in the future. For now, my take home is that there are better pet arachnids out there. But if you have to have a Sulfugid, then the Sulfugid is probably the best pet arachnid for you. Just don't give up on them too soon. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. How are you feeling, Clint? Feeling good. Yeah? Yeah. Why are you feeling good? Um, well, I've got some rad arthropods to show you today, and I have more children than I used to have. <laughs> Uh, is that a, is that you guys mated? <laughs> well, at some point. <laughs> What's that one? Is that something to be excited about? Having more kids? Yes. Okay. We, we, in all humility, Leisha and I make some rockin' kids. <laughs> okay. They're really, they're really good kids. Air conditioning, Jason. <laughs> How is this a my problem? <laughs> I don't know if you know this about things. But if you do something once to be helpful, <laughs> it often becomes yeah, an expectation there. <laughs> I need to uh, commit to doing that. Yep. Yep. So don't do it. I'm not dead. Well, nothing is, you know, I put, I'm not dead. Not dead not yet. Dead. <laughs> but I would love to change that in the future if it turns out that they're only mostly dead. Because there's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. He's dead, he can't talk. Look who knows so much, huh? Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Please open his mouth. Good for you guys. I'm so proud of you. For knowing a reference. <laughs> yeah. When they're actually... Darn you, doggy! <laughs> but it does reflect... I knew I could fake him out. <laughs> But it does reflect. <laughs> <laughs>